Good morning. Um, first of all, you know, LinuxCon is always a great conference, and uh, the Linux Foundation folks put up a good show. You know, they, when I first started talking to Jim when Linux Foundation was founded um, in 2007-ish, about 2007, 2006, 2007, it was really about getting developers and customers and um, users together and making that easy and, and have a very well-managed conference. And Jim always gets on here and says, thank you for coming and thank you for joining the LF and all that stuff. But nobody ever thanks Jim and his staff for putting together a great conference, right? And, and I was last year, I was talking um, at LinuxCon in Seattle and I did the same thing. I think um, we should have a big applause for the Linux Foundation folks, right? They, they've always done a really, um, a really great job. It's, very, it's like a very professional environment. So anyway, um, there were talking, was talk about uh, 25 years Linux yesterday, and I, I, I was watching Jim's keynote where he was talking about how many lines of code changes there every day. And uh, last night, I started using Linux with 092 something uh, way back in, in the almost early, early days. And so I downloaded the tar file and untarred it, and it's, it's about 5 megs. So 0 0.99.15 or something, way back one was about 5 meg source code. So then I downloaded 4.7, I untarred it. It's 730 meg, right? I mean, it's like 130 times difference in, I mean, many years, but it's a massive change. There's, of course, a lot of device drivers and stuff, but it shows that Linux in those 25 years has really grown a lot. And, Another example of that was the config options that started in 099, there's like 100 of them. Now there's probably 16,000. So uh, if somebody wants a PhD project or they're bored, you should put a book together and actually explain all these config options. I think a lot of people would be happy because nobody really knows uh, to make sense of them. Um, anyway, so I joined Microsoft exactly five months ago today. And um, to be very honest, a year ago, I would not have considered it, and three years ago, absolutely no idea if I would ever even want to talk to them. And so um, I certainly had a different sentiment many years ago about what Microsoft was doing, and certainly around the open source space. But in the last several years, the company has changed, and in, um, in January, I personally started talking to some folks at Starbucks <laughs> um, outside of the campus. And um, Scott Guthrie, who runs the cloud and, and enterprise division, and Mike Neal, who, who works in, in that organization, we, we talked about Microsoft and open source. And um, what I came away with was open source is actually very important to Microsoft. It has been in the last few years. It's very important going forward because the way they want to grow Azure, the way the company needs to um, you know, really be more open and seen as an open um, company in order to grow. Uh, open source is a critical part to that. Linux specifically, but open source in, um, in general. And so that has started um, happening in the last few years. And so, you know, in this slide that, that I show here, you can, you can kind of see how, you know, the first thing happened somewhat in, in, uh, in 2009, and K I see KY here in the audience. So um, Microsoft contributed the Hyper-V drivers um, to, to the Linux kernel upstream, and you know, that was sort of the first foray into open source and certainly into Linux from Microsoft as a company, but it was specific to enable Hyper-V um, drivers and, and run Linux well as a, as a guest. And then Azure became popular and, and started being built out, and Ubuntu got um, deployed as a guest in Azure. Um, Docker became interesting and, and there was some initial work done around Docker. But then you can see in the last year to year and a half, a lot more things have happened. Um, Visual Studio Code was released last year. It's a really great editor with a lot of extensions for different languages and, and so forth. It's a very popular code editor that runs on Linux, Windows, Mac OS. Um, PowerShell DSC is, is a sort of an extension for, um, for PowerShell that was released last year. Then another thing that started happening, which I think is also important to, to understand, is Microsoft actually uses a lot of Linux in-house. A lot of services that are being deployed in Azure actually run on Linux, not just Windows. And so within the company, there's no longer a, it has to be on Windows. In the company, when engineers are discussing to build new services or to create new, even new products, it's like whichever OS works best for what we need to do, that's the one we pick. 
That's a huge difference from two, three, and certainly more than that years ago. And it's actually very exciting to see. And you also see that when you talk to the developers. So in my few months at, um, at the company, you know, from the outside world, I can tell you I had little visibility. I saw the .NET release a few years ago. It's like, oh, that's kind of cool. And I knew about the Hyper-V drivers. But beyond that, it's sort of a black box. And so when I joined in, uh, in end of March, and I started talking to different groups, there's actually a whole lot of stuff out there. And on GitHub, there's hundreds and hundreds of projects that are completely open. The developers work out of the public GitHub trees. That's where they do their day-to-day -day work. And so within the company, GitHub is also used for private repositories to kind of foster that sort of working together. Teams across the company are trying to be open within the company and then open to the outside world. So it's a big shift, which is actually very exciting to see and, and, and one of the reasons I joined. Then another thing that happened, and so um, it was kind of cool for Jim uh, Whitehurst to be on stage, Red Hat and then Microsoft. That's a big difference from many years ago. <laughs> um, anyway, so we, had, we have a great partnership with Red Hat. Um, and then we announced SQL Server earlier this year. In March, Microsoft announced SQL Server on Linux. And so that's being productized and somewhere. Um, it's currently in preview. I don't know exact release date. But SQL Server as a production database will be available on Linux. That's a big shift for a company that was Windows on Windows only. Right? And why is that? Because Linux is very important. Because customers are using Linux, customers are using open source, customers have the choice, and then the companies react to that. And it's another testament of how um, Linux has really sort of you know, um, taken over a lot of the market. Um, then what happened last week, and, and Jim mentioned that earlier um, when he intro introduced us here, um, we, we launched PowerShell. And PowerShell, I don't know how many people here know it, probably not too many, because it's hopefully a, a pure Linux. <laughs> the PowerShell guys are right up here. They're the ones sticking their hand up. <laughs> anyway, so PowerShell is a very important management tool for Windows. It's a framework and a, a shell, but it's, it's something that pretty much every Windows user uh, certainly in the enterprise uses. And there's a lot of cool stuff around PowerShell. I wrote a blog, was it yesterday or the day before, and I said it's not a replacement for Bash, it's not. It's not about, hey, here's something you put on Linux and, and forget about the stuff you, use, you used in the past. But it's a nice framework that you can build on. And one of the cool things is we have this huge ISV ecosystem that has built extensions for PowerShell, and now that will also be available on Linux. And another thing is you can do sort of remote management. So you can manage your Windows systems from a Linux server, and you don't have to use an RDP client and play with a GUI. You can actually start managing Windows from a Linux environment in a command line interface, which is kind of cool, because I don't like GUIs either. Um, and the other way around. So Linux, um, Windows admins can, can manage um, Linux um, servers and stuff. Anyway, it's a really cool. Um, product, and it's completely on GitHub, so it's basically done the way I guess it should be. It's on GitHub, you file issues there, you can send pull requests, there's no hidden code trees, there's no private code base, it's completely open. Under MIT license, it's completely out there. And I think it's a good example of taking something that's actually quite core to a Windows ecosystem and just saying, here it is to the world, and, and make it available. And then I think yesterday, um, we announced some um, container management uh, extensions to the um, operations management suite, which is a Microsoft management product. But it also shows that, again, it's no longer, it's a Windows-only world. It's very well known within the company that it's Windows and Linux. And we have to make sure that we, we attach both. So already talked about PowerShell being open source. I, I looked at the, um, at the GitHub API to see the number of downloads. I think last night there were about 50,000 downloads of the, of the packages if my bash script worked. <laughs> um, about 50,000 downloads already on, on GitHub. Um, another thing that, that's interesting is Azure, which is the Microsoft Cloud um, platform. One out of three VMs today are Linux, and it's growing really quickly. And it's an environment or an area we really are focused on. And what Sacha says and, and what sort of the direction within the company is that it's very important that Linux is a first class citizen on Azure. And so everything we do, certainly in my team on the Linux side, um, we just hired Matthew Wilcox 
which is kind of funny. I'm sure a lot of you folks know him. Oh, there is Matthew. And so, you know, Matthew joined Microsoft, right? <laughs> a dirty little secret. When I was talking to him, I said, you know, the shock factor when you tell your friends if you join the company, it's like, okay, you sold me. So it was kind of cool. <laughs> anyway, so Matthew's a great guy. I've known him for a long time, and it, it's very exciting. Of course, there's already an existing uh, Linux contingent at the company with KY and some other folks. Stephen Hamminger is just joined, um, who's done a lot of work on the, on the network side. And so one of the things I wanted to point out for, in sort of in terms of strategy as to what we're doing with open source is that a lot of the contributions in the past um, have really been around the extensions to make Azure work, the extensions to make Hyper-V work. And everyone then says, well, sure you do that, it's for your own interest. Now, with hiring folks like Matthew and others as we continue, what's important at least to me, and sort of direction as to what we're, we're going to do with open source is we want to start helping Linux improve, not just Hyper-V, but in general. Work on stuff that has nothing to do with Microsoft. The same with other products that we work on. We, we want to just be part of this development community. Um, these are different words than people typically use when they talk about Microsoft. <laughs> um, we use enable, integrate, release, and contribute. Um, enable, we want to make sure that all these different open source products work really well within, within our ecosystem. Integrate is really about customers want to use open source components, so we make sure that, that they integrate within Azure particularly or even on Windows Server. Um, release is about looking at Microsoft IP and when it makes sense that this can be cross-platform, then we make this um, publicly available, such as um, PowerShell. And then contribute is contributing to third-party products and making sure that we, we help other products um, work better. Or I shouldn't say work better. We help improve it, um, I think is a better word. Linux investments, um, just, just a brief overview. So the Linux integration services are basically the guest extensions um, that, that have been written. And it's important that we do that because, you know, I said earlier, we want Linux to be a first class citizen in, in Azure and on Hyper-V. And so we have to make sure that we can do all these things like PCI pass through an SRIOV and making sure we have secure VMs booting and all that stuff because we want the performance to be way up there, right? Um, Operation management, and I think that's also an interesting one. So what we could have done, and what the company probably would have done a few years ago is say, hey, we're going to do Linux management, we'll write our own proprietary tools, and we dump them on the Linux box. And we all know that Linux users don't want binary blobs uh, on their system. So instead, we use FluentD as an example. So we use open source tools, we take that, and when we find bugs or we can improve it, we'll contribute that back. Right? And so I think that's a good example of how the company has made a, a big shift in, in terms of what we're doing and then um, releasing a lot of um, other components. I'm not going to put a lot of effort into this slide here, but what, the reason I added this was to show that Linux and Windows needs to work equally well. And if there are cases where we can make Linux run better, we will do that. Right? And so it's very important here that we're not in, a, in an environment anymore where somebody at Microsoft would say, oh, you can't work on that feature because it would ad, ad, have an advantage on Linux over Windows. There's no one saying that. If we end up writing code that makes it better, it'll be better. And then the other guys have to make sure that their stuff works better. So it's a very you know, equal environment that we now work in, which again is a, a very cool uh, change in, in the company. Um, the ecosystem. This is, I mean, everyone here you know, says, well, yeah, of course, duh, right? But I think it's important to show that from, again, the way we now work with open source is the way we should have worked with open source, right? We work on the Linux kernel. What happens is it goes upstream. Once it gets upstream, then you know, Red Hat picks up the latest kernel and gets the drivers and gets the code. If they don't have it, then we help backport it to the existing versions. We just do it the way it should be. So this is not about, oh, look at us. It's, hey, yeah, we know what we have to do, and we just do it the normal way. And so we do that with the other projects that we work on as well, like the way we work with PowerShell and, and Cloud Foundry and other stuff. Um, these are a few examples of what we do. <laughs> so FreeBSD is actually still quite popular, in particular when you do virtual appliance in cloud. There's a lot of network appliances and some storage appliances that rely on FreeBSD. So like with Linux, we contribute there. And one of the cool things is that um, 
about two weeks ago, I think, one of the members of our team that works on FreeBSD was um, invited to be a director on the FreeBSD uh, Foundation Board, and that shows how, how much effort they've been putting into it um, for the products. Cloud Foundry is the same. You know, Cloud Foundry is important to customers, so we work on it, we help, con we contribute to this thing, and we do work with Pivotal and others that have commercial solutions, but the way we contribute is upstream. We don't build proprietary extensions. We make it work upstream, then the other vendors can take it and do whatever they want with it, but customers have the choice to go to Cloud Foundry and download their own version, and it will all have the stuff that, that we've worked on. Same with OpenStack. Um, we're not direct contributors to OpenStack from a source code point of view. We, we actually work with a partner that does some of this work for us for enabling Hyper-V and, and Windows. Um, but we do have a big CI that's hosted at Microsoft. It's a few hundred servers that basically run 24-7 and are integrated into the OpenStack um, development CI. So it's actually a pretty sizable uh, environment that helps OpenStack QA whenever uh, a new check-in occurs. So with that, because I'm running um, out of time, um, I think, you know, if anything, Linux is part of day-to-day -day work or life at Microsoft now. It's really just uh, there. Open source is part of day-to-day -day life. A lot of the developers at Microsoft, in fact, see this as a career opportunity within the company. Um, there's, a, it's, there's just been a great shift, and I'm personally very excited to be working on this stuff, and I think you'll see a lot more coming because we want to show, we've done a lot of outreach, we've done some projects, and sort of in the next year, we want to really show that this is for real. It's not just me here on stage talking about it, but we have to show the code, right? Because that's ultimately what it comes down to. So you'll see a lot more actual work happening, and uh, it's a different company than it used to be. So with that, I'm going to show a little one minute video, and uh, that's it. So thanks for listening, and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. My name is Alex and I live in Moscow. I live in Rome. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. And I'm from Houston, Texas. I live in Tokyo. I use uh, Linux systems at home, I use Linux systems at work. I code and test in Linux, I use some of the uh, test frameworks. I do a lot of work with Linux for my internal customers. I assist customers in ensuring that their Linux systems are up, accessible and performing well. I think it's collaborating with the global community of people. The power of the community is greater than uh, the sum of all its individual members. I'm doing all of this at Microsoft in the Azure Linux support team. I am working as a technical evangelist in Moscow. Um, and I'm an open source software specialist.